The Bible says man cannot live by bread alone. And I say thank goodness for that. Cheers, cheers. The never-ending quest to satisfy our senses has led to some of humankind's most magnificent creations. That's a lovely vinegar. But it's also gotten us into a whole lot of trouble. From the downfall of governments... So, in real life, you don't think that the troopers would have looked like that? No, they're mutineers. They were, they were rum core troopers. They would have been rum-soaked and pretty rough around the edges. ..to discoveries that have changed the world. So the largest company in the British Empire was dealing drugs on an industrial scale. Our passion for what we eat and drink has altered the course of history in ways you have to see to believe. Disgusting. For thousands of years, one drink above all others has influenced Western civilization. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt were the first to use it in ceremonies. The Romans dedicated a god to it. And the Christians built their most important sacrament around it. What is it? Of course, it's wine. But strange as it may seem, the world's oldest vines are nowhere near Europe. They're here in South Australia's Barossa Valley. I love these old vines. They look really great, don't they? Look at this gnarled old beast. That's pretty good, isn't it? Excuse me. Excuse me. There you go. Can you tell me anything about these vines? Oh, these vines? Yeah. Well, to us, they're, they're quite significant. These, these, these vines were planted back in 1843. Really? Who yeah. by? Uh, it was a German migrant called Christian Oricht. And uh, him, as well as the, the fellow uh, settlers, were all planting vines, you know, early in the 1800s. And because these are unique as far as they've never had phloxera or disease, that it does make them some of the oldest uh, surviving vines in the world. Yeah, I suppose just the fact that they've survived means they must be making pretty good wine. Exactly. If they weren't, they wouldn't be in the ground. Sure. Yeah. T take a look at this, will you? Have a, have a good look, because that is possibly the oldest vine, not only in the Barossa, not only in Australia, but possibly in the universe. I think you would agree. Oh, I would agree with that. It doesn't matter whether it's old or not. Damn good wine. But none of this would be here at all if it wasn't for the vision of another German migrant. His name was Johann Menger, and he was very idiosyncratic and quite solitary. How solitary? I'll show you. This is the only image of him that's known to exist, but it captures him perfectly, dishevelled, bookish, and a real recluse. This is where he spent most of his time, all on his own, down here by the side of this creek, which incidentally is called Jacob's Creek. This is the Jacob's Creek, which I never knew existed. I thought that was just something that had been made up by PR men in order to make their product sound a bit more countryfied. But anyway, Menger's shelter was this cave, which is now called Menger's Cave, which can't have afforded him much protection from the elements, can it? He may not have been much of a homemaker, but when it came to soil and minerals, Menger was second to none. For two years, he roamed South Australia, scouring the ground for possibilities. And of all the places he travelled, it was the Barossa that got him really excited. He believes that this area could become very fertile. In fact, it was his passion that persuaded the South Australia company to invest so heavily in it. He said, one day, all around here, there'll be vineyards and orchards and swaying corn. And it must have seemed completely daft at the time. But the funny thing is, he was absolutely right. One of the first to take Menger seriously was fellow German Johann Gramp. In 1847, he planted the first vines on the banks of the Jacobs Creek, his faith was amply rewarded. 
150 years later, Gramps Winery still produces one of the most successful wines in the world. <laughs> Thanks to pioneers like Johann Menger, Australia now has a thriving wine industry. But on my next time travel, another trade in alcohol did not have such a positive impact on the nation. In fact, back in the early 1800s, its power was so great, it brought down a government. Sydney, 1808. 20 years after the arrival of the first fleet convicts, the British penal colony is finally getting off the ground. The food supply is stable, the local indigenous resistance has been quelled, and the population is growing. But there's a problem. As more and more convicts poured into New South Wales, its rulers felt themselves increasingly vulnerable. They knew that they had to rely on the army, but this wasn't the cream of Britain's redcoats. This was a bunch of blokes without prospects, recruited from Britain's poor and unemployed. And they were all too eager to exploit the powerful situation that they now found themselves in. And they did so by using a substance they were already pretty familiar with. Virtually indistinguishable from the convicts, except for their red coats, they soon became known as the Rum Corps, the most powerful and unscrupulous group in the colony by far. The red coats cornered the market in this stuff, rum. Although, actually, the word rum was a catch-all phrase for virtually any strong liquor. They didn't just use it in order to get hammered, though. As far as they were concerned, it was a bona fide currency. The wages for the construction of some of the most famous buildings in Sydney were paid in rum. The wanted posters for the capture of bushrangers advertised the reward in rum. There's even a story that one bloke sold his wife for four gallons of the stuff. And it was absolutely Disgusting. How did rum come to be the currency? Well, it's a story that goes back to the very beginning of the colony. When Governor Arthur Phillips suddenly returned to England in poor health, he left a power vacuum that the officers of the Corps were quick to exploit. Out went Philip's instruction that soldiers and convicts should receive the same food ration. Out went collective farms. In came massive land grants to fellow officers. It wasn't long before the Rum Corps officers grew rich, and no one grew richer faster than John MacArthur, owner of the best farming land in the colony and the de facto leader of the Rum Corps. MacArthur had a reputation for being willful and cantankerous, but in the new governor, he finally met his match. His name was William Bly, already famous all over the empire for having survived the mutiny on the bounty. What would it have been like when these two came face to face? A clash of the titans? Well, for more than a year, it was actually more like a chess game. So, Paul, we've got our two sides lined up. Oh, whoops. Over here, we've got the, uh, the Rum Corps, the army. And over here, we've got the authorities of New South Wales. Who are the two kings? Well, William Bly represents the authority in New South Wales. He was a stickler for the rules. Not particularly imaginative, but certainly someone who took orders, but also expected others to obey them. What about MacArthur? What was he like? Well, MacArthur was the opposite to Bly. He was engaging. He did understand people and could uh, manipulate them. So when Bly arrived, he was tasked to clear up this rum racket. Wasn't yes, it? and of course to break up the, uh, the, uh, the power of the New South Wales Corps, yeah. uh, who had uh, made a lot of money uh, in the colony and to uh, re-establish 
uh, the rule of the governor. So what did MacArthur do in reply? Well, MacArthur was most concerned because Bly had threatened his land grant, which was the basis of his empire. And so MacArthur tried to exert his authority over Bly to see who was preeminent. It all came to a head on the 26th of January, 1808, 20 years to the day after the colony was founded. MacArthur had managed to convince the Rum Corps that their lifestyle was at stake. The army was ready to depose their boss, the king's representative, and create an entirely new government. In the heat of the day, 400 of them marched the short distance to Government House to arrest the governor. Bly must have been furious. After all, this was the second time he'd been the subject of a mutiny. The half-drunk soldiers searched high and low and finally found him hiding under a bed. This is Australia's first political cartoon. It was created within hours of the mutiny and was intended to ridicule Bly. But does it actually capture what happened? It's not great art, is it? No, no, it's not, Tony. It's a fairly ordinary drawing. It's a pretty, pretty lousy draftsmanship, but your eye follows the drawing very neatly, and, of course, Bly is the focus. And he'd already had one mutiny under his belt, so I don't blame him from, for, for, for cowering under the bed, if indeed he did, but... This you say is... if indeed he did, you think he might not have? I think he probably didn't. I think he's a pretty, pretty tough fellow. I mean, he's a hard, old-time Navy man. He'd be fairly fearless. But the troopers hold the key. They are drawn as the great guardians of society. They're like grenadier guards. They're magnificently poised. So in real life, you don't think that the troopers would have looked like that? No, they're mutineers. They were, they were rum core troopers. They would have been rum-soaked and pretty rough around the edges. And it says so much that so people would believe that Bly was found cowering under the bed with his chamber pot. So how would you have drawn it differently? I would, I'd have started with the troopers, OK? Say Bly was under the bed, the way I'd go about drawing the troopers, I'd draw them like a, like, like a proper rum rebellion mutineer. And they'd be dishevelled, you know, they'd be a bit fly-blown, and, you know, they'd be pretty rough around the edges. Don't forget these guys are using rum as currency. They wouldn't have the, the fine grenadier guard look about them. And I'd have this guy reaching down, grabbing Bly by the throat, Superimpose this place on top of this trooper. You'd have a completely different image. You know, he's blind, he's being monstered by these mutineers. Suddenly, you feel quite sorry for Bly now, don't you? Yeah, poor old Governor Bly. But this wouldn't be the last time a conflict over what we put on the table would pit Australians against their government. I'm now jumping forward a century to the 1930s when a food shortage sparked a riot. In Adelaide, at the height of the Great Depression, a thousand men, women and children marched here to the office of the South Australian Premier. And it wasn't jobs or money they were after. It was something rather more tasty. Ray, what was it like here during the Depression? <clears throat> well, for the majority of the workforce, it was tough, very, very tough. One third of the workers in Adelaide, were, or in South Australia, were unemployed. So how could people afford to eat? Well, the government provided rations, then they could go to the local shop. Very minimal sort of uh, supplies, and they're very restricted in what was available for people. But if there was at least some food available, why did a big riot kick off? There'd been complaints about the quality of the food amongst the unemployed, and it all came to a head when the government decided to take beef out of the rations and replace it with mutton regarded as an inferior product. So we're talking about the beef riots? Absolutely. So excuse the me, beef. can I uh, just borrow this for w one minute? What was the date of the beef riots? It was January 1931. And uh, by some eerie coincidence, look what we've got in our sandwiches, beef sandwiches. Tell me about the riot. Well, there were two groups that, that were participating. One from Port Adelaide, a working class community. Here they come, yeah. And they met up 
in Adelaide with another group, a group of single unemployed men. Where are they heading for? To the Treasury building where they hope to have a deputation meet the Premier, Lionel Hill. There you are, that's here. So you've got these two wings of the demonstration, then what happened? Police moved in, Is a police... battle ensued. Right, so here's all the police charging out of the Treasury. Here's more police coming in. Ray, ray, go on, my son. So a battle Is... ensued. And was it bloody? Absolutely, there were people taken to hospital. Yeah. 12 policemen were taken to hospital. Oh, coppers as well, right? Coppers there as well, are. yes. Yeah. And what was the result of this demonstration? Well, that was one small victory, I suppose, of the beef pride, and the beef remained on, on the rations for the uh, remainder of the Depression. Well, thank you for telling me all about that. I hope you don't mind if I take a, a few of these. Are you all right to do the clearing up? Oh, uh, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> In an era where so many were stripped of their dignity, reclaiming your food of choice was a major win. But on my next time travel, I'm going back three centuries to a time when controlling the food supply didn't just mean protesting, it meant something much more ruthless. In the 17th century, the British desire for new goods spurred on trade like never before. And there was one organisation more than any other that spearheaded that expansion. It was called the East India Company. It single-handedly dominated world trade and its dock was just there, next to the Millennium Dome. The 1500s was a period of great exploration. Merchants braved uncharted waters in their quest for new goods and partners to trade with. But it was a dangerous and lengthy business. Spain and Portugal had divided the world between them and jealously guarded their territories. But after the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, that total dominance was broken. A group of London merchants petitioned the Crown for permission to sail to the Indian Ocean. After a couple of attempts and lost ships, they were granted a royal charter in 1600, which gave them the exclusive right to trade in the East. It was the East India Company that gave birth to the whole notion of London as the international hub of world trade and finance. It was the most powerful company in the world. It changed people's ideas, their culture, their tastes, even their politics. It had its own merchant navy, its own army made up of British and Asian soldiers, and it controlled an incredible 50% of the world's trade. Hard to believe, isn't it? Trade on this kind of scale led to changes in polite society too. Every fashionable home worth the mention had to have Chinese and Indian paintings hanging on their walls. Curry from India became an elitist cuisine as recipes and often East India Company cooks made their way to London. It was a business on a scale never seen before in the world's history. And that in itself led to another industry, the service sector, which started with a product which most of us in England are pretty familiar with, particularly first thing in the morning, a nice cup of tea. Although, Markman, I thought that in the 17th century we were coffee drinkers, not tea drinkers. Indeed, in the 17th century, uh, Britain was a coffee drinking nation, the first coffee drinking nation in the world. Um, London was a place which uh, foreigners found incredibly exciting because it had a huge number of coffee houses and merchants and East India company traders would go there after the hours of the exchange to continue business and to talk about deals and to sell their wares. But coffee's popularity was a problem for the East India Company. In those days, coffee was imported from the Eastern Mediterranean and the East India Company didn't have authority to trade in that area. Their solution was tea, 
but that meant trading with China. Did we pay for our tea in cash or did we trade other products? Well, the East India Company really wanted to trade products for the tea, um, but there was really nothing that the Chinese were particularly interested in buying that Britain produced. They tried textiles and uh, guns and other sort of manufactured objects, but China was this vast, wealthy market which had no interest in anything that Britain produced. But we did find a product, didn't we? Indeed, the East India Company decided that it could sell opium. So the largest, most important company in the whole of Britain was trading drugs to a foreign nation on an industrial scale. On a massive scale, taking huge cargoes of opium from Bengal to China to raise enough money to pay for the tea that they wanted to buy on the Chinese markets. The proceeds of all this enterprise began to transform my neighborhood. Thousands of ships' workers from India and the Far East swelled the immigrant population in East London. While the ship owners and wealthy businessmen built properties to reflect their newfound status. When I was about 13, I used to play in this park with my little mate Steve. But what I didn't realise in those days was that a few hundred years ago, it had been owned by Sir Charles Raymond who was a sea captain and had made a fortune out of the East India Company and had become a banker too and invested a large amount of his money into this. Valentine's Mansion, lovely little stately home. And there used to be dozens of houses like this dotted all over London and Essex, all built or renovated from money that came from the East India Company. Anyway, about five years after I used to play here with my mate Steve, he started a rock band, which he called The Small Faces. And his name was Steve Marriott, and he wrote a song about Valentine's Park, which was called Ichiku Park. And what do you do there? You're confronted by some of the last remaining evidence of the East India Company. The British thirst for luxury goods like tea and coffee created a corporate monster the likes of which have never been seen again. But strangely little else of the East India Company and its dock survive, apart from a section of the old dock wall and a plaque. So far, my journey through the world of food and all manner of drinks has revealed a surprising number of serious dust-ups. And my last stop is no different. I'm off to the 1920s for a dispute over dessert. In Wellington, New Zealand, a performance once took place that started a culinary controversy that would turn two friendly nations into foodie foes. In the year 1926, here at the Grand Opera House, the theatrical event of the year took place. The most famous ballet dancer in the whole world, a woman so talented, they said that she didn't just dance, she flew as if on wings, appeared right here. And what was the name of this exquisite piece of loveliness? Anna Pavlova, the prima ballerina, at the Ballet Russe. She jetted, she pirouetted, her adoring crowd cheered her to the rafters, and then she was off again. She turned up in Australia, and once again, she jetted, she pirouetted, her adoring crowd cheered her to the rafters, but it wasn't just her dancing that inspired people. She had the most gorgeous costume, a white tutu dotted with green silk cabbage roses, and they inspired this. And afters, a dessert with the meringue and the cream representing the tutu and the kiwi fruit being the green cabbage roses. It is, of course, a pavlova, or as they say around here, a pivlova, or something like that. But the interesting thing about this particular dessert is that it has created the most monumental row which has gone on for the best part of 80 years. And the row is about 
who first invented the pavlova? Was it the Australians or the New Zealanders? Was it in Perth or in Warrington? <laughs> it is very creamy. Well, I can now tell you that officially the Oxford English Dictionary has pronounced that the very first Pavlova, Pavlova meringue was created here in New Zealand in the year 1929. So at this moment, all New Zealanders should be glowing with patriotic pride. Do you want a bit? Taste. On my time travels through gastronomy, I've witnessed the power that food or the lack of it holds over us. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's built empires, created heroes, and sparked international conflict. And it's no wonder, as much as we dress it up, we all need food to survive. If I die and wake up here, I'll know I've lived a good life. I wonder what culinary creation we'll be fighting over next. 